Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by my friend and colleague and, and recent converse, conversationalist, uh, Linda Chavez. We had a good conversation, very good, I think, honestly, on immigration three years ago. And uh, I, I think you laid out the issue uh, in a way that's extremely useful uh, for people. And I recommend that they go back and uh, watch it or, or, or listen to it or read the transcript. Um, but I thought we should update, to say the least, our, our conversation today. On immigration, Linda has had many positions in government and, and think tanks and, uh, and knows this issue particularly well, though is generally a wise commentator on public affairs. Uh, Linda's senior fellow at the National Immigration Forum and a colleague of mine at Defending Democracy Together. So Linda, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. It's great to be with you. So immigration, you know, when we discussed it three years ago, it was a hot topic, Donald Trump, he had run on it, he was governing in certain ways, the Democrats were, and others were fighting back. Um, and then what's happened? I mean, it's been a year since Joe Biden, um, almost exactly a year, right, won the presidency, and the issue, I won't say it's disappeared exactly, but it's, I don't know, it's sort of odd what's happened, it seems to me, in terms of policy and politics. So anyway, tell us, where are we on immigration? It is very odd. Uh, you know, the only time we seem to be focused on it is when we have, you know, thousands, even tens of thousands of people uh, at our southern border trying to get in. Uh, but on the day to day, once we sort of clear uh, the people from under the bridge, the Haitians were the most recent uh, group that tried to come in uh, back in September. And once once we you know, deal with that immediate problem, we go back to ignoring it. And that means that nothing changes, nothing gets better. Uh, and you know, we don't deal with the underlying problems, which is what we need to restructure our immigration laws. And I think politicians on both the left and the right wish this issue would just go away. Uh, the right, I think many people on the right know that we do need immigration reform. We do need to change our legal immigration laws but they can't possibly say that in the GOP of Donald Trump. And on the left, I think they realize that um, the American people are not for open borders. They are not for just letting anybody who shows up uh, come in willy-nilly into the country. And so they you know, also have to be wary because if they say that, uh, they will irritate uh, the progressive left. So we are, you know, we're in a stalemate and it's not good for the country. Well, yeah, let's, I want to get to the border, which has been the one thing that's been most visible and, and the, the most politically salient uh, aspect and maybe is paralyzed action on other aspects of immigration, but just on the substance for a minute. You made the case three years ago uh, that we need immigration, we need probably more immigration, we need, quote, high-skilled and, quote, lower-skilled immigration. Obviously, the system needs to be reformed in all kinds of ways because it is very, uh, I don't know, everyone who deals with it knows how cumbersome and arbitrary it can be. But it is kind of amazing, isn't it? I mean, we've had two years of everyone's of COVID and therefore almost partly because of COVID and partly because of, I guess, Trump changes and regulations and so forth, Trump administration changes. We've had very little immigration, I believe, right? And, and everyone says, oh, there's this terrible labor shortage, especially for some low-skilled uh, entry-level jobs, which immigrants have been taking disproportionately. But no one even says, well, and then we also want to do much more in tech and so forth, where there's some high-skilled opportunities for immigrants. And it's sort of amazing to me that the Biden administration and Congress, whether on a democratic basis or on a bipartisan basis, has done just nothing. I mean, I, or maybe they've done stuff beneath the surface that I don't see beneath the surface, or, but I don't know. Isn't that kind of a... That's exactly right. I mean, and, and part of the problem is that, um, you know, they have the experience of the George W. Bush administration, and you know this experience well. Uh, George W. Bush did try a major overhaul uh, of our immigration laws uh, back in the mid 2000s, and it didn't work. Uh, he was derailed by Rush Limbaugh and the whole a uh, group of uh, talk show hosts uh, who really riled up the masses uh, and created the kind of populist mob that helped create Donald Trump. So I think, um, I think that's, that's part of the problem. But look, we do have um, a big problem at the border. Last year in fiscal year 2021, 1.7 million people were apprehended trying to come into the United States. Now the ordinary listener hears that and thinks, oh my goodness, we've got millions of people coming in and you know, adding to what they may think are tens of millions of illegal immigrants already here. 
That's not true. Uh, the 1.7 million are people who are apprehended. And of those 1.7 million, about a quarter of them have made multiple attempts. Uh, and in fact, about a quarter of them had tried to come in the previous month. So uh, it's not like these are all new people. More than half of them are immediately turned back. They, they don't step foot really into the United States. Uh, if they are in family groups, uh, if they're unaccompanied minors, uh, and if they're claiming asylum, uh, there are conditions in which we do bring people in, we put them uh, in detention, uh, and we try to deal with their applications. However, uh, during the Trump era and because of the pandemic, uh, the Trump uh, administration invoked something called Title 42, which is an old law uh, which says that you can close the borders if there is a threat to public health. And obviously COVID is a threat to public health. And obviously, you know, during the height of the COVID crisis, before we had vaccines, before we had adequate treatment, uh, you couldn't let a bunch of people come across the border and come into the United States, even on a temporary basis. And so um, the Trump administration said, no, uh, you can come and show up and want to claim asylum, but you're going to have to wait in Mexico. Well, Biden and uh, progressives in general thought this was cruel and inhumane because, in fact, you had tens of thousands of people just on the other side of the border, many of them in these sort of makeshift camps, uh, unsanitary conditions, no health uh, available, no health care available. Uh, and so uh, President Biden tried to change that. He basically said, no, we're going to go back to the old way of doing business. We're going to take asylum uh, seekers as they come. Uh, however, um, the administration was sued and by uh, the state of Texas and Title 42, as a result, is now back in place because of a, an order by a district judge. So we're back to square one. We have lots of people um, who can't come in. Uh, some of whom have legitimate claims uh, for asylum. Um, and we don't have any fix whatsoever to the major problem, which is bringing in people, as you say, who are willing to work here and who are going to do jobs that are not taking away jobs from Americans, but doing jobs that Americans are, number one, too educated by and large to do. You know, the average American has more than a high school education. Uh, you know, I don't assume you or I or, or most Americans uh, look at their children uh, in school and say, you know, honey, I want you to grow up and be a janitor. I want you to be cleaning office buildings at night. You know, they have better dreams and opportunities. But for people who have no work opportunities in their home country, those jobs are a stepping stone. They're the, the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. And so we do, uh, we do have people who are willing to do those jobs, and we have yet to find a way how to bring those people in. So let's, yeah, that's, it is kind of striking. And the, and the administration seems, I don't know, maybe they're more paralyzed than they need to be because of the problems at the border, but let's just stay on the border for a minute because that's been all the news. So looking at it, I mean, how much of a problem do we have of illegals coming across the border? How much of a problem do we have of chaos at the border? Is it sort of what we've experienced for 30 years and we shouldn't get too alarmed about it and just go about our business and fix the rest of the immigration system and assume the border is going to be kind of messy for the next while? What's the right balance on that? It's really what we experience, uh, have experienced for 50 years or more. Right. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the question of particularly people from uh, Mexico and Central America uh, who see this country as a land of opportunity. They want to come here. They want to make their lives here. Some of them don't want to stay here. They just want to come and work, maybe put in a few years working, send money back home to their families, and then go back home. There's no way for people who want to do that on any large scale to do it. Uh, we do have some temporary visas, seasonal visas, um, but the uh, morass, the, the uh, red tape that you have to go through, that employers have to go through to get those kinds of season works makes that impossible. But in terms of the historical picture and where are we now, as I said, the 1.7 million apprehensions, biggest number uh, ever recorded. Um, I don't know if you looked at it in terms of uh, the rate and you know, our population is obviously much bigger than it was 50 years ago, but it's a big number. The number of people who are unauthorized and living in the United States, however, has been holding steady for years. It reached its peak almost 20 years ago. 
between 2000 and 2005 was the uh, largest uh, number of people living unauthorized in the United States. We had over 12 and a half million people uh, then. We're at about 10 and a half million people now. Uh, so the number is not uh, historically great. And certainly as you know, when you compare it to uh, our population, it's not a huge number, but it is a problem. And um, the, you know, the, the chaos that you sometimes see happens when word spreads uh, in a community as it did in the Haitian community after the storms hit the island, after the political violence there, that America would offer refuge, that they would offer asylum to Haitians. And so you had literally over 10,000 people showing up in one little town uh, on, the, on the border with Mexico, and they ended up camping under a bridge. The scenes were terrible. Um, the enforcement efforts uh, looked very bad, although some of the original claims that people were being you know, attacked by men on horses and whipped turned out probably not to be true, although we haven't gotten the full picture yet. There was an investigation going on. But nonetheless, the people were rounded up. They were put into buses some of them not even knowing where they were going and they were sent off to airports and sent back many of them to Haiti. Now these were people um, in large part who hadn't lived in Haiti in a decade or more. Uh, these are people who had left Haiti years ago, had made lives in mostly South America uh, and those lives weren't going well. And so that's why they left um, and came here. But those kinds of scenes, I think, make people feel that we are under siege uh, and that there are these hordes of people who are going to rush our borders. And I think that's an incorrect view. Um, and I think the, the way in which the administration handled it was not particularly deft. They, uh, they weren't uh, well equipped and they didn't seem to know it was gonna be happening, which um, you know, if you follow these issues, all you had to see was the storm hit Haiti to know that we were going to have a rush. I mean, Haitians, uh, unfortunately, since 1980, Haitians have uh, tried to claim asylum and refuge in the United States, and I believe have been treated unfairly. They have been treated differently, for example, than Cubans who have sought refuge here. Uh, so, it, you know, it shouldn't have been a surprise to the administration. I don't think they handled it well, but at least for now, that has calmed down, although we do have reports that there are more Haitian migrants on the move up from um, Latin America, from South America, up through Panama and through Central America, and who knows uh, when or if they will emerge. But we have a lot of Haitian immigrants in the United States actually, and we have data presumably on how they're doing. And my vague impression is they may not be doing super terrific, but they're doing okay. And it's not like, you know, crime surgers or something if right. 10,000 Haitians show up. So, I mean, it, they almost all have high school educations. 20% of them have uh, college degrees. Uh, they don't earn quite at the median level uh, of American families, but it isn't all that much below. It's about 10% below uh, the median. And uh, they're, doing, they're doing well. I mean, if you compare Haitian immigrants, for example, uh, to the native born black population, Haitians do better than native born blacks in a lot of measures. So I don't think we should be so worried that somehow if we let these people in, that they're going to become permanent burdens. Uh, that's, you know, that's always the fear uh, of people who are worried about immigration is that somehow these people are never going to become Americans. Well, with Haitians, they have the highest rate uh, of all of the, you know, major uh, group refugee groups of naturalization and becoming U.S. citizens. So, you know, they do become Americans. They have higher than average uh, English speaking. Uh, rates, even though they come from a country where English is not the native language. Uh, so they do, they do do reasonably well. So do all, most all of the other groups. I mean, it is really rare to find a group, even a group of people who come here illegally, who are not striving to make a better life and aren't in fact making progress toward doing that. They are not coming here to be on welfare. They're not eligible for welfare. They are not coming here to steal jobs. They're coming here to take jobs where there's, you know, help wanted signs out and nobody else is showing up to take them. And I think that the, you know, not only most humane thing to do, but the best thing for America to do is figure out a way where we can bring these people in in an orderly fashion, 
uh, have a flow that is going to help our country, help our country grow, contribute to our economy, and solve the problem that way. But unfortunately, nobody in Congress is listening. I mean, that what, what you just said sounds like what an intelligent Biden advisor would have said, frankly, a year ago, and what we're going to do differently from Trump. Um, and what happened? They just got paralyzed by the border situation, or it, Congress turns out to be unreceptive even to the most kind of common sense, you'd think, reforms that pretty manifestly aren't going to deprive Americans of jobs and so forth, and that would just rationalize a kind of current system where there are, as you say, there are these provisions in law for temporary workers, I guess, and seasonal workers, there are other provisions in law for green card holders, and all of it seems to just not work at this point because the system is so broken. We have a backlog uh, in terms of people applying for uh, green cards of 5 million people. Uh, so those are people who are eligible for green cards, who are in the system, who put in their paperwork, and they can't get a green card. Uh, and what happens is those green cards essentially expire annually. So if we have, you know, X number, let's say 750,000 uh, green cards available in a year, but because of the backlog and obviously the pandemic made that worse, we only distribute 500,000 of them, those 250,000 are lost. And one of the provisions now being talked about on the Hill is a way to essentially recapture uh, those uh, green cards uh, that were authorized but not, never used. That would go a long way to helping uh, get rid of the backlog. Uh, but there and is- These are people who want to come legally, obviously, that's, that's why right. they applied for green yeah. cards. And they're I eligible. Take it. They're eligible. They have you know, first order relatives here, or they I have- I see, so they've deal. already passed the first yeah. hurdle in a sense. Right, they, they've, passed the, they've passed the test. They just can't get themselves in. And if they come in, they could get jobs because they would have green cards. Correct. But are they eligible even for welfare? I don't know that they are even so. Uh, no, well, um, it depends on how you define welfare. No, they're not uh, eligible to get a check from the government, you know, for living expenses. Um, their children uh, may be eligible school. for certain kinds of SNAP and some of the food programs. And by the way, that's become a big uh, battleground as well, because the Trump administration decided that any immigrant who took advantage legally of what was available to him or her would be prevented from ever becoming a US citizen. Uh, they would be considered a public charge. And therefore, if you know you were a family, let's say you were a Mexican family with you know, a couple of kids and both mom and dad are working jobs, but they still can't quite make it. And so they get a little bit of assistance from SNAP, from the, the food stamp program. The Trump administration said, sorry, you'll never be a US citizen because you're a public charge. Well, the, the um, Biden administration has tried to undo that, but again, this is being battled uh, in the courts and how it will ultimately turn out is anybody's guess. So, yeah, I mean, so let's talk about the Biden administration for a minute and then get to Congress maybe. I mean, it's, it just feels to me, but I don't follow this issue very closely, that there's been a certain lack of focus and I don't know, uh, competence is probably too strong a criticism, but, uh, you know, serious, I'm sure they're serious, but successful attempts at least to prioritize certain things to say okay look we'll we'll bracket the question of what to do about x y or z later and the border stuff and we're, we're we made some mistakes and we're working on that but meanwhile we have x million people daca recipients here who it seems everyone kind of agrees it's crazy for them not to have a path to citizenship and to be reassured that they're not going to be expelled and we have x number of green card applicants who want to be here legally and businesses and everyone tells us we need to have some of them here to work. And so there are, seems to me that you could make three or four arguments that are pretty common sense. And at one point might not have been terribly controversial even in terms of politics and partisanship. And I guess, well, you can say A, now are they controversial in Congress would be, I don't even hear the Biden administration making those arguments. I guess that's what strikes me. I would have expected, I might not expect that Biden to succeed. I mean, God knows that Congress is evenly divided. They're not succeeding on election reform or a million other things. But you do hear them at least make the argument for why we need to fix the electoral system. I don't even hear the arguments on immigration, but maybe I'm not paying enough attention. I don't know. Oh, no, it's it, you're not hearing them because they're not being made. Part of the problem is, and I think this sounds very parochial, but it's true. It's a guy from Delaware. What does he know about immigrants? You know, what does he know about the you know, the constant uh, change that has taken place over the Southwest or even the South, the, uh, the American South now is, uh, is uh, the base of, of, of many immigrants who come to work in, in agriculture. 
So I think there's a little bit of tone deafness on his part. I don't think this is something that hits him viscerally. For George W. Bush, it was intimate. He understood this. He was a governor of a border state. For Ronald Reagan, it was intimate. He was the governor of California. Uh, anybody from the Southwest understands the immigration uh, issue in a kind of intuitive way, in a way that a politician from a state like Delaware probably is not. But there's also the case of, you know, what priorities you have coming in. You know, I remember back in uh, 2009 when President Obama came in, uh, there, were, there was great hope that President Obama was going to do something on immigration. But he wanted to get health care passed. And he knew that if he was going to get health care passed, uh, he had to devote all of his attention. He had to expend all of his political capital to get that done. Well, now you have Biden. Um, and he has these grand schemes for, you know, social change, the, the new great society that he's trying to create. Um, and so immigration just isn't up there. And, you know, I look at, at the, uh, the bill, the big human in infrastructure bill that uh, President uh, Biden is, is introduced. And I think, you know, one of the best ways you can improve human infrastructure is to bring in more human capital. Uh, and too bad he didn't think of it in those terms. Too bad he didn't really integrate it um, in that way. Now, some of the pro-immigration forces on the Hill um, have been trying to convince the parliamentarian that indeed we can put some sort of uh, immigration uh, fix uh, in the reconciliation bill so that we only need you know, 51 uh, votes in, in the Senate, uh, including the vice president. Um, that hasn't gone over. Um, the parliamentarian said no. There are a lot of, of advocates who are saying ignore the parliamentarian, uh, do it anyway. Uh, but your bet is as good as mine. But my guess is that, you know, even if they were successful in doing it, again, it would end up back in the courts. And I'm not sure we'd solve anything. It really takes somebody with an understanding of the issue, a vision, and the willingness to go to the American people and make the case. It is a case that can be made. I spent years going out around the country, speaking to Republican groups, speaking to conservatives, going into rooms where people you know, thought initially that I was crazy, but the more I spoke, the more I explained how messed up our immigration system was and how you know, much better it would be to fix it, the more people sort of came over and said, well, you know, that, that's, I'm not against immigrants. I'm, not, I'm only against illegal immigration. And so, you know, but, you, but it takes the willingness to do that. And he hasn't been willing to do it. Um, Kamala Harris, who is from a border state, you know, she was sort of given that as part of her charge. She hasn't done much of anything. And we just haven't seen the kind of national leadership to put this on the table and to make this a national discussion. Well, it strikes me as if you, I think if you ask a lot of economists, uh, okay, there are all these things Biden wants to do and he wants the economy to get going as we all do after COVID, but also in a stable way that's not too inflationary. A lot of them would say, you know what? Immigrant, just having a normal flow of immigration again. And I want to come back to this and ask you what the real flow is today, but a normal flow of legal and if necessary, to be honest, undocumented immigrants as well, just to, is one of the best things you could do for the, for economic, for non-inflationary economic growth and non not taking jobs away from Americans and so forth. And so you're sort of ignoring this whole, leaving aside even the fancier arguments about, you know, human capital and second generation, and which I also think are important, but um, you're taking away sort of one of the most obvious things you can do. And then you're claiming that, well, these other things are going to help or not, and they may help. I'm not even taking a position on that. I just, it is kind of odd to just exclude this whole thing. I guess it's not odd because it's so politically controversial, but the other stuff's politically controversial too. And I, I just, this occurred to me as you were talking about, you know, Biden has these great society-like ambitions in 1965 and the equivalent of Medicare and all that. One thing that happened, wasn't it 65 or was it 64? Is there was a huge liberalization of immigration. I mean, why doesn't he look at that thing that Lyndon Johnson and, you know, the Democratic Congress did as a, in addition to all the other things they did, right? I mean- well, that's right. Now, if you're an immigration restrictionist, you look at that 1965 immigration uh, reform and you say, oh, that's why we got all of our problems. I yeah, mean, but Biden doesn't, no, didn't, doesn't, doesn't believe that. that. And I don't think the evidence bears it. Oh, anyway, that's a fight right. you should be willing to have. You really should think be willing that, to have. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you're right. Um, you know, I haven't seen the very latest figures for uh, fiscal year uh, 21 and how many 
uh, green cards we gave out, but I know that we did not give out the full complement of green cards. Um, and as I say, that you know just adds to that backlog. And part of it is bureaucratic. Part of the is the fact you don't have people sitting in their offices uh, processing the paperwork. Um, and by the way, you know even some of the paperwork itself is difficult. It's you know if you if you've got documents that you need to get from your birth country, uh, and your birth country happens to be a country that's been devastated uh, by uh, COVID, and in which they're you know really you know everything is ground to a halt, you're, you're not gonna be able to come up with that. So yeah, it, it, part of it is that. Uh, part of it is that there's just been uh, a slowing down of the normal process. But it also, I think, is, is almost planned. Um, I mean, this is what Trump did. He lowered the numbers, you know, he, he ended up not giving out the number of work visas that were available. It used to be that, you know, a work, uh, there are special H-1B programs where employers get certain kinds of uh, workers. Um, and once they would announce the number for that year, within two or three days, they'd all be gone because the employers were there and ready. Well, Trump actually, you know, slowed that process down. So we didn't even bring in the people that were authorized. On the refugee front, I mean, this was an area we, we've mostly been talking about immigration. Refugees are different uh, than immigrants, but in the refugee program, Trump just shut it down. He just essentially wasn't letting in any refugees. And people had great hopes when President Biden came in that in the first year, you know, that we would go from, you know, basically none, fewer than 10,000, we'd see a big jump. In fact, that didn't happen. Um, there were the number for uh, fiscal year 2021 was kept at 12,500. That is a tenth of the historic figure. I mean, in, in times when you've had huge refugee uh, problems around the world, the, the United States has always been the most generous country. We've always taken in you know, 100,000, 125,000 a year. And, um, and, and they've done well. I mean, look at our Vietnamese community. Um, look at Russian Jews. Russian Jews were huge beneficiaries in, in 1980 of the Refugee Act. Um, they've all done very, very well, but that program was literally, um, it was more than decimated. There was only 10% of, uh, of the number uh, that was available, uh, that normally would be available, that were given out. Now, this next year, uh, 2022, uh, we are going to uh, see, you know, more. And even at the end of last year, because of the Afghan situation, the number eventually was raised, I think it was raised to 65,000. But again, that's still half of uh, what it had traditionally been, particularly when you look at these refugee crises around the world. As I say, we have more people on the move who've been displaced because of war um, than we have, you know, in any period since World War II. You uh, just on the Afghan situation, that will be tens of thousands at least of, of yep. refugees. And do you feel like we're at least doing an adequate job of, you know, getting them, helping them get resettled and started and so forth? It's a little early to know. I will tell you because I had personal experience with the Vietnamese experience. Um, I took a couple of bro brothers into my home um, and um, did it through a local Catholic church. Uh, and brought them in, picked them up at Dulles Airport. This was in the middle of winter. I can remember they had on uh, flip-flops uh, on their feet, even though there was snow outside, they had no winter jacket, they were wearing short sleeve shirts. Um, and you know, we brought them in, we took them to Walmart, got them clothed. Um, one of them just retired from the FBI recently. He was mm -hmm. a computer um, person at the FBI. So, you know, they, they did very well, but, but it wasn't difficult for me to do that. You know, uh, there was a, a mechanism. I've said that I'm happy to take an Afghan family in now. Um, I happen to have a farmhouse in, in rural Virginia that uh, we use on the weekend and, you know, could house a, a whole family. But there doesn't seem to be, you know, any mechanism. It, it isn't as if there's a, a big network out there helping integrate these people. So I, you know, I, I think the jury is still out. Um, I'm glad we brought these people here. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, it's going to work as well as previous, previous resettlements have. But the whole infrastructure uh, of the refugee resettlement uh, community has been, was undone during the Trump years. 
Uh, most of the resettlement is not done directly by the government, but is done by uh, organizations, uh, U.S. Catholic Services, the Hebrew Immigration, um, Hias, uh, yeah. you know, different Lutheran immigrant, uh, uh, Lutheran refugee uh, program. And um, because it was so severely cut back during the Trump years, they lost their funding. They lost people. You know, they're trying to hire as well. So um, it, uh, it, it's going to be, I think, a more difficult uh, process uh, than we uh, necessarily should have had because of what was done during the Trump years. And I guess vetting Afghans is a little more complicated than vetting. It is. That's Vietnamese right. Vietnamese in 1976 or something. So, absolutely. But, absolutely. I mean, but, the you know the Vietnamese, um, you know, people look now and say, oh well, they you know did very well. Their kids are all going to Harvard. They're doing great. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, talk to the farmers uh, and fishermen uh, in Texas down in the Corpus Christi area when the Vietnamese uh, fishermen started coming in. Uh, they weren't real happy. Uh, they were not welcomed with open arms. So there was conflict there too. And as with the two young men that I took in, they were they were literate, but barely, um, and you know had a very little formal schooling. So you know we sometimes we always look back on the immigrant groups, the refugee groups, and we always sort of romanticize them. Well, they were different. They were you know they were ambitious and they were committed to being Americans. Well, it, it always uh, is a little bit of a romantic view. It was harder even in the early 20th century uh, than any of us want to admit. Say a word about DACA and the quote dreamers. I mean, that just seems like something that was teed up. And, and then Trump, of course, there were fights about it during the Trump years. But I, I think if one sort of went away for, had come back, left the US on, in November of a year ago and came back a year from now, and someone said, well, what's the status of those dreamers? Are they finally on like some reasonable path? Yeah, I think, I think he or she would be a little right. surprised to find out that the answer is, if I'm not mistaken, that nothing has changed, right? No, in fact, it's, it's worse than nothing has changed. I mean, what has ended up happening is you have about 700,000 uh, DACA recipients who are in the program. They've gone through the paperwork. They, you know, they, they are eligible uh, and they've been accepted into the program and they have authorization to work or to go to school um, on, under the program. The problem is, um, again, uh, so these are people mostly who were brought to the U.S. As they were, as they were all brought to the U.S. Yeah, they had to have been uh, brought as children. Um, they had to either uh, have graduated from high school, be in school, you know, in college, be in the military, or have a job. So you couldn't have people who were, again, going to be public wards um, participating. You, and, and the paperwork was voluminous. I mean, you had to come up with years of, of records of bank accounts and where you'd lived. And it was, you know, it was a, a very strong vetting process. Okay, so there's 700,000 of them. Well, there was a court case uh, that challenged DACA. It went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court put it back down at the district court level. And uh, just a few months ago, the district court judge in that case said, all right, it's an illegal program. It's unconstitutional. President Obama did not have the authority to do what he did. He had violated the administrative um, act, which requires that if you're going to make changes using a kind of regulatory process, you have to go through the formal process of issuing regulations, putting them out for public comment, uh, and going through, you know, uh, the bureaucratic uh, rigmarole that you have to do when you want to change laws or change regulations in the United States. And of course, Obama didn't do that. He had his uh, Secretary of Homeland Defense simply issue a memorandum of understanding that outlined uh, the DACA program and outlined some other procedures for the parents of DACA children and for temporary protected status people um, who are here. Uh, they have legal status here because we've given it to them, but it's protected. So anyway, so the judge in Texas basically said, no go, you've got to come up with regulations. And that is exactly what uh, the Biden administration is in the process of doing now. They, are, they have gone back to the um, to the playing field and they've written up regulations. Um, they have got them out there for comment and we'll see, we'll see what happens. But this is really for Congress. I mean, ultimately yes, this is, right. ultimately, you know, this yeah. is fixable oh, by right. oh, yeah. passing a oh, law. Yeah, and by the way, you know- And, and aren't there millions of them? You, you mentioned several hundred thousand, I guess, who are in the program. That are actually in the program. Yeah, there are more than, more than I think about a million and a half of them who, at, at least um, I see. who would be eligible. Uh, but these are the 700,000 who actually have the protected status of DACA. But 
you know, I think, again, most people would be surprised to hear that the whole concept of DACA was a Republican idea. Senator Warren Hatch, Lindsey Graham, they came up with this idea of we shouldn't punish children for the sins of the father. We, you know, want to give them a pathway to becoming American. And many of these kids, you know, they don't speak the language of, of their uh, parents' country. They don't uh, identify as anything other than American. We have paid good money, good taxpayer money to educate these kids. And yet, you know, they're, unless we give them some legal status on a permanent basis and give them a pathway to become citizens, they, um, you know, they could end up finding themselves back, you know, on the streets of Guadalajara or, you know, San Pedro Sula or, you know, any of the other countries where their parents came from, uh, the cities their parents came from. So, uh, th this is really a tragedy, and we're talking about the most high achieving of uh, the group of immigrants. I mean, these are these are kids who, um, you know, have graduated high school. They are earning a living. Many of them are in college. I mean, there are doctors, there are nurses, there are scientists, uh, people who, you know, done extraordinarily well. Uh, even though they grew up poor and under adverse circumstances, they really, you know, are living the American dream. And, and to essentially get rid of them, to take them out. I mean, it would be a huge hit to the economy. Uh, and it would be just, I think, brutal and inhumane. But just leaving them in limbo also curbs their ability to do certain things and right. make plans, of course, and live their lives. And uh, no, it's really, I, I find that part kind of astonishing. And then aren't there other, but sometimes you hear the figure about you know, 3 million, 5 million that's not, those are not DACA recipients, but those are other people for whom there have been, would have been legalized, so to speak, right, under various proposals. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a whole bunch of different categories. There, there are people who are uh, in the category of temporary protected uh, status. Uh, these are people who may have come from someplace like Haiti during a, uh, a hurricane right. or from an earthquake in Central America. And they were in the United States unauthorized, either they had temporary visas that ran out or they had come in uh, unauthorized and various presidents have given them temporary protection. We're not gonna send you back to Guatemala City uh, where you know, you've know you just had a major earthquake or we're not gonna send you back to Port-au-Prince because you know it's, it's chaos there. Um, and what has happened is those protected status uh, provisions have been re-upped. So, you know, maybe it was initially for five years or 10 years and it and has kept going. Well, as a result, many of these people, again, have built lives here. They pay taxes, they work, they pay taxes. Some of them have had children who are U.S. citizens. Um, and at a certain point, you know, mo I think it's two thirds of the people who are unauthorized in the United States today have lived here more than 10 years. Mm. You know, at what point do you say, we haven't done anything about this. We haven't solved this problem. We haven't even enforced our laws. At what point do you say, you know, this is, this is crazy. We've, we've got to change our law. Uh, so when you, know, you hear the number about the millions, that's, that's some TPS, temporary protection status, yeah, and some, some them, DACA, but a lot of them are just, just, I mean, are, let's just say the, you know, illegal people who came across the border illegally or who were undocumented, who have been working, or actually more of them, more of them uh, are people who came here legally, but their visas expired. But their visas visa expired. Yeah. And they're, whatever they're doing, they're doing, and they're sort of in limbo because we've never right. succeeded over years now, decades, decades in passing legislation to uh, rationalize or routinize their either, obviously, to send them back on the one hand, or to, uh, and which would be mounting them up and so forth, or to uh, give them some path either to citizenship or to permanent, you know, resident status, I suppose. And I mean, so they're just, that's where you hear the numbers about the millions, right? They're just in this that's kind right. of limbo. The 11, yeah, the 10.5 million in, right. includes all of the above. And, uh, and by the way, you know, just uh, giving them the status to be here legally. I can remember back during the debates during the Bush years about uh, bills, um, there was a lot of polling done of the un unauthorized population itself. And a majority of them were fine with just let me be here and work. Um, and, and if you want to deny me citizenship, I mean, I like that, but you know, um, right. I'm willing to accept that if that is the, the price to pay for getting legal status. I think there's you know, some question about whether you want a two-tiered society in which you have a group of people living here permanently who can never become citizens. 
Uh, but um, that was at least on the table as an option. That's never discussed now. Um, and, uh, you know, they are people who, as I say, they pay taxes. You know, again, Americans don't understand, uh, I think, that just because you are here uh, illegally, you, you, you're not authorized to be here. If you're working, even though you're not supposed to be working, uh, because we do have laws that say you must be here legally to work, um, you know, most of those 10 and a half million people are in fact working and virtually all of them, well, all of them are paying some taxes, uh, but virtually all of them are paying income taxes. Uh, if, you know, if they work for an employer that withdraws money for FICA, for Social Security and Medicare, that comes out of, of their pay. Uh, some of them have uh, something called an employee identification number, and that money goes into a file under that. Others are using social security numbers that are not their own. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find if there's a Linda Chavez out there who's contributing to my social security. I mean, this, you know, this does happen, uh, but that's not, that isn't harming me. Uh, yeah. It's not harming you. Uh, they're paying into the system. All of them pay taxes, real estate taxes. If you rent a property, you're paying as part of your rent taxes. Your employer, your uh, landlord sets the rental price based on what he or she has to pay in taxes in addition to, to other factors. So they all pay that, they all pay sales tax. Uh, so they are taxpayers. Uh, they are contributing uh, to the system, not to mention they're consumers. Uh, and many of these live in communities, small communities or rural areas where they're the lifeblood of the community. They, you know, they've started the stores, they're buying the cars, they're buying the houses. Um, so you know, the idea that somehow these are freeloaders uh, is just wrong. So how much, I guess, uh, how much could be achieved by the Biden administration simply doing a better job of making the current laws and regulations work better and maybe being more willing to take some criticism by letting more people in and going up to the maximums of the different, uh, you know, uh, limits and, 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 and sort of just streamlining administrative actions and so forth. And how much really does require congressional action? I mean, how much of the system just needs to be fixed by Congress? I mean, I... I Ultimately, the system needs to be fixed, but it would certainly be better if, for example, we could get rid of that 5 million backlog. I mean, if the administration said, look, this is a priority. We want to, at the very least, make it possible for people who are entitled uh, to come here because we've said they are, uh, and we're going to process their, uh, their work, then, you know, at least that would get done. But that would need Congress to say you could... Well, it would need, yeah, it would need, it would need money uh, spent and by the bureaucracy. It would need hiring people. It would be need being more efficient. And most of all, it would need placing a priority on it. Right. Uh, it wouldn't take Congress to fix the idea of using the um, unused visas that, that are available. Um, and I think the Niskanen Center um, is, has put out a paper uh, really detailing how much money that would bring into our system. Uh, if they simply, you know, did that and, and brought in these people and, and gave them their green cards and, and they became contributing members uh, of American society. So some of it has to, has to have congressional action, um, but part of it could be, uh, at least a beginning could be made to solve it by better administrative action. And there could be some congressional actions that would deal with parts of the system and not everything, right? I mean, it's not, you could do DACA, just by That's itself. Right. That's right. And in fact, I mean, this has been where the progressive have not always been helpful. Um, the progressives know that, um, you know, particularly Republicans being more business friendly, uh, they want to fix the H-1B program that brings in, you know, certain kinds of people on uh, work visas. They want to fix certain other things. And the progressives don't, don't necessarily want those dealt with because their fear is, well, they'll deal with those and then they'll never get to the big enchilada. Uh, well, we haven't gotten to the big enchilada in all these years. So I would say, you know, uh, a slice of bread is, is, you know, better than, you know, no, uh, no bread. And so I think, I think that's unwise. And, um, you know, it's sort of a, a symptom of our politics today is that, you know, it's all or nothing. We can never, we can't sit down and really compromise and decide what's, uh, what's really necessary and what we can do now and quickly uh, we always want to, you know, aim for the big picture, which may be unattainable. And do you think the current Republican Party is so interested in even talking about 
some slices of red or is it just so Trumpified that no one will step up and do that? It's, it's a little hard to know. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously the Republican Party is very Trumpified. And when you talk about, you know, election or election reform, that kind of issue, certainly uh, that's not going to go anywhere uh, with this uh, group of Republicans. On the other hand, you know, the election, the 2020 election, uh, I've been writing about this for decades, literally, that Hispanics were, in fact, uh, more likely to vote uh, Republican than most other uh, minority groups, um, yeah. certainly more so than, than Black Americans. And it turned out to be true. Uh, it turned out that, you know, even in South Texas, along the border, a lot of Mexican Americans liked Donald Trump. You know, more men than women liked him, but they voted for him. So um, I think, you know, I think the Republicans are sort of recognizing that. Um, certainly, you know, Glenn Youngkin, who just won election in, in Virginia, um, I think he made aggressive outreach uh, to the Hispanic population of Virginia, which is a growing portion of that state's population. I think uh, it was only about 5%, I think. Yeah, so. uh, but, you know, 5% can make the difference between winning or losing an election. So I think that, you know, I think they're around the edges. I think you could get some movement by, by some Republicans. I can remember a discussion I had with Mark Meadows back uh, when he was in Congress as opposed to Chief of Staff at the White House in which you know, we talked about immigration and he acknowledged me, we have to fix the problem with agricultural workers. He, you know, he represented an agricultural area. He knew that they needed workers. He knew that, you know, that the current system didn't allow them to be brought in. So if you, if you could in fact come up with a series of bills that dealt with specific problems, you know, it's possible you could do it and it wouldn't even be, you know, a major story. It wouldn't even be something that, you know, Trump and Fox and others could rail about. I wouldn't bet the <laughs> the trouble is that yeah, they would they would rail, and therefore this gets back to your earlier point that you need leadership on the other side to make the case, right? Because I mean, you can't just it's not like Tucker Carlson's going to not know that you know or that the anti-immigration types aren't going to be alert to attempts to, to do things. I do think Youngkin, if you want to take the glass half full, which we're talking on November third, I guess the day after uh, Youngkin's victory in Virginia, um, if you want to take the glass half full, from at least my point of view. Uh, account of Youngkin's victory. I mean, he accommodated Trump in all kinds of ways. I don't like it all. Uh, but I, I will say this, on immigration, he said nothing, basically. Whereas Ed Gillespie in 2017, at the height of the Trumpist hysteria, a year after Trump had, had won uh, the presidency, partly on immigration, was you know going out about the borders and uh, illegal immigrants here in Virginia. Um, so maybe there is a sort of damping down of the mm -hmm. anti-immigrant immigration fervor yeah. among some Republicans at least and that, that would give a chance for the Lindsey Grahams of the world to re-emerge re in Congress next year as a force for good. On the other hand, it's an election year and the actually you look at the people who are running for the Senate, you see the hysteria, right? In, in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and other states where you might once have had more reasonable Republicans. Right. So I don't know, what do you think the overall, I don't know, is uh, and Trump's still there, right? And he's- Right, Trump is uh, still there. Um, Although, you know, he does talk about it at his rallies, but it's not the centerpiece right. now of his of his message. His message now is all about you know, how the election was stolen. Right. Um, and I do have the feeling that it's receded a bit, um, you know, in terms of the public awareness and public focus, even though we've had the little, you know, blips at the border with the kids coming in during the spring and, and the Haitians coming in in the fall. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to know. It's one of those culture issues, of visceral issues um, that has the uh, ability to, you know, inspire the worst in, in, in people. And so it's, uh, it's hard to know whether or not you'd have enough uh, courageous Republicans to do the right thing. I think a good number of the Republicans on Capitol Hill, not the Marjorie Taylor Greene, certainly not, you know, the uh, Madison Cawthorns, those, those people know. But you know the the sort of ordinary Republicans. I think they know um, that the system is broken and it's got to be fixed. And uh, I I think as they're looking and seeing, you know, that maybe there are even some avenues to get Hispanics to vote Republican. They're thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't engage in this hateful rhetoric. So um, you know, I guess I'm a glass half full person. No, and I think that I mean the Trumpists take some pride in the fact that Trump did better among 
mm -hmm. uh, Latinos among Hispanics. And so there's a way there to that takes the edge off the immigration message because you can't quite at the same time say they're a horrible threat to the America we love and we're proud that they're voting for us. I mean, I guess you could say that, but it's a little incoherent. But well, so let's get to the Democrats. I was ultimately though to make this happen. You need, I think, don't you think, I mean, presidential leadership and more than presidential kind of, uh, well, presidential leadership to pull actual members of Congress together and then leadership to pull, you know, civil society and advocacy organizations together to get people behind whichever pieces of legislation, assuming it's not going to be a comprehensive bill, uh, that, uh, you know, could be passed and put other things on, you know, back burners and stuff. You need actual, someone needs to, it's not going to happen. I don't think spontaneously, right? And maybe yeah. there'll be some good yeah. good people in the House or the Senate who just get together and make this happen, a gang of eight, but it feels like you need, you have an administration that's nominally committed to all kinds of immigration reforms. And uh, but, so I get back to the Democrats. Why do you, you know, is there a chance that they will pivot to this? Is, is it too hard to do in 2022? Is there too much resistance within the I think Democratic they're really, coalition. I, I think there are two things. I think they've got their, you know, eyes focused on the big money items uh, like the, you know, the the bill that's um, yet to pass as of November third. Uh, but hope springs eternal on the in the Democratic heart that it will pass. Um, so I think they're they're distracted by that. Um, but again, there hasn't been the kind of leadership. There hasn't been someone who's sort of taken this issue and run with it. The new senator from uh, California, Alex Padilla. His parents actually came to the United States illegally. He grew up in a household in which he had to worry about his parents being deported. Um, he's the type of person who could take a huge leadership role in this. I wish he would. But you do, you have to have somebody who's willing to make this their, you know, number one issue. And, and you know, the Hispanic caucus has never been as effective um, as a political caucus as some of the other caucuses have. The, the Progressive Caucus, the Black Caucus. Um, they just haven't seemed to be able to, you know, garner the kind of enthusiasm around their issues. And obviously, you know, Hispanics get irritated when you say, you know, act as if immigration should be an Hispanic issue. Uh, it isn't the number one voting issue for Hispanics. It's actually far, far down uh, the list. Uh, but there is, um, but there is an emotional tie there. And, uh, and so I think, I think you're gonna have to have somebody who, who has that, you know, Ted Kennedy fire in his belly, who's willing to, to go out there and, and take this to the people. Uh, the business community um, also has not played the most positive role. They're starting, I mean, you see ads now, at least on cable TV, about the role of immigrants and particularly the, um, you know, the essential workers that, um, that we absolutely need and depend on, many of whom are, are foreign born, some of whom are not here legally. Um, but the, you know, the business community needs to focus on it. I can tell you, I sit on a corporate board of the largest janitorial company in, in the country. It's a public company, right? New York Stock Exchange. Our biggest um, worry is about the labor shortage. You know, we can't find people to take those jobs as janitors cleaning buildings. Um, the pandemic uh, in, in some ways gave us breathing room because buildings shut down and we weren't doing as much cleaning. Uh, but now when they're opening up and we've got jobs that we can bid on, we have to come up with a way to find people to take those jobs and they aren't there. And, you know, the progressives say, well, if you pay them enough. Well, the fact is you can't, can't pay 30, 40, $50 an hour for somebody to clean an office building at night. It's not gonna happen. It's not economically feasible. Um, and so you do need people who are coming in for whom this is a good job. It's a job that will provide their kids a better life, um, but you know, um, they, they don't have a lot of other alternatives. They don't have college degrees. Uh, they don't often have the English language skills that allow them to get white collar work. So, um, you know, again, just finding Finding a leader, uh, we need a leader. Yeah, and I don't think the CEO of any company, I don't know your company, I mean, is going to on his or her own kind of start calling Senator Cornyn in Texas or Senator Rubio in Florida and, and many other Republicans and say, hey, come on, look, let's bracket these other fights we're having about yeah. culture and you know whatever you want, all these other things. Can't we just agree on a more reasonable green card program or more reasonable sets, you know, uh, way to help more get more people into these jobs, which everyone agrees, including your own constituents, your own business supporters, uh, they, they should get, or can we legalize the dreamers, which are also a lot of their constituents. 
But I, I kind of come back, I guess, to Biden and the administration. It's pretty hard when you have a Democrat, when you have a president of, of a party, it's a little hard for senators and congressmen from that party to really step up beyond the administration. They can do it sometimes. Jack Kemp did it as a Republican. Mm -hmm. Ted Kennedy did it as a Democrat, but it's still not quite, uh, uh, it's harder. And I guess that comes back to the administration not making this a priority really in, in its public rhetoric and or in its legislative strategy. I mean, yep. it's striking if you say infrastructure, 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 and I don't know, I guess you just can't do two things at once maybe, but I don't know. What do you think happens over the next year or three years? Of um, well, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe there will be some small fixes. I think this recapturing uh, visas, uh, that's a fix that yeah, probably wouldn't be that controversial. It's the kind of thing you might be able to stick in a bill and, and get through. Um, I do think you're going to see, you know, big changes in, in refugees because we have this population of Afghans. Um, but making the case that we need, you know, a million and a half immigrants every single year in order to sustain our economy, in order to grow as a nation, in order for the rest of us to prosper, that's an argument that can only be made by the top leadership. And uh, as I say, I, I just don't think President Biden has it in his gut. It's just not, you know, he, he when he talks, you know, as a lunch pail guy in Scranton, you know, from Scranton, you can tell these are, you know, some of these issues are issues that he really feels strongly about. Uh, but I don't think he feels that strongly about this. I just don't think he, um, I just don't think it's, it's where his uh, heart is. And unless somebody else comes up, and, you know, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, whom I had great hopes for, um, he's been very challenged uh, in this job. And, um, you know, I, I don't blame him. Uh, he's been handed a, a bad set of facts and, and uh, had to deal with them. Uh, but you don't get the impression that he's on speed dial from the Oval Office either. And that's, right. you know, that's the other thing. Um, if you're not in that inner circle, and if, and if the people in your inner circle do not see this as a big issue. I mean, I can't think of a person in the White House um, or anywhere for whom this is a huge priority. I just, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of anyone. Now, given the extent to which uh, there was a genuine widespread reaction against Trump on immigration, a genuine sense that we've got to get serious about that issue, uh, it, and I think that was a very strong reaction, of course, among, on the left and among Democrats, but among anti-Trump or even not anti-Trump Republicans as well. As you say, you see it with Youngkin not picking up at least the, 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 the demagoguery on it. Um, it's sort of amazing how little I think has been yeah, uh, I mean, worrisome. You know? Yeah, in, in the first few days of office, you know, he issued this very broad bro proclamation of what he wanted to do in immigration, you know, 90% of which I agreed with and thought was a good plan. But then it went nowhere. Is that right? And he hasn't really come back. To he hasn't really come back and said, OK, well, let's, you know, uh, let's do this or that. And, and, you know, he again, I think he's worried about jeopardizing, um, you know, the rest of his agenda. I was uh, on uh, Jake Tapper's show uh, a while back and, and Paul Bagala was on with me and I made this impassioned <laughs> plea for immigration uh, reform and why it was, you know, why wasn't the Biden administration dealing with it's an urgent problem. And Paul Bogala said, you know, it isn't urgent. Uh, he has urgent problems and he hasn't, you know, there are important issues and urgent issues. This may be an important issue, but it's not an urgent issue. I beg to differ. I think it is an urgent issue. Yeah, it's usually one way which is urgent is if you don't make progress now, I don't think you can count on the Republicans or a large part of the public staying in, let's call it the Glenn Youngkin position. This, right. There will be some other stuff at the border and there will be right. some incidents somewhere in America where some immigrant does something, you know, undocumented immigrant does something terrible. And uh, and then it'll be demagogued again and we'll go back in a way to 2015, 16, it seems to me. That is, I, I think it's a mistake of the Democrats to assume that they don't solve, begin to right. resolve this problem. Agreed. They, uh, you know, it, it just, they can have a sort of status quo of a low simmering, you know, sort of problem that can be dealt with five years from now. And meanwhile, they can do this other stuff that just doesn't feel right to me, actually. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, 10 and a half million people, they get up every day, they go to work, they try to provide for their families, they have to be looking over their shoulder. Uh, you know, if you talk to some of these communities, the only place they feel safe is in church. Uh, because, you know, there isn't usually enforcement at the church. They're afraid to pick up their kids at school. 
They're afraid they can't go to PTA meetings. They're worried that they're going to be picked up. Um, you know, they're, some of them, I think, are the best drivers in America because they, God forbid, they should be pulled over because they have a broken taillight or, you know, they've gone five miles over the, the speed limit. So, you know, they, they live lives of, of terror. Uh, and it's not right. Uh, it really is. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a humanitarian issue. And you know, when you think of their children, um, you know, kids can lose their parents. They can come home from school, and and their dad has you know been picked up at the construction site, and their mom, you know, um, is left, or or maybe she too has been picked up. Uh, you know, I lived through um, some of these raids when I was on the board of a different company, Pilgrim's Pride. Uh, back in 2008, when uh, the chicken factories uh, were raided, uh, you know, people's lives were incredibly disrupted. And by the way, Pilgrim's Pride was an early adopter of e-verify. You know, we didn't hire you if your uh, papers weren't verified. That doesn't mean that people couldn't, you know, come up with phony I IDs, and and that worked. But it was uh, I can remember, you know, that board was made up of a lot of good old boys from Texas. And all Republican, 100%. And, you know, I can remember the way they talked about what it was like the day of that raid. And one of them described it to me as he said he felt like he was in Nazi Germany and the stormtroopers were at the door. He said he couldn't believe the way they showed up at the processing plant, you know, with baklavas over their faces and, you know, black armor and, you know, looking like they were breaking into a, a drug cartel. Uh, all to take people who were working at, you know, low wage jobs and, and uh, trying to provide for their families and, you know, sending them home. It was but is that happening now or is that at least it paused? Is Dr. That is, well, that has stopped. Um, so the Biden administration, in, internal enforcement, they basically, they have prioritized who should be deported. And interior enforcement, they will go after the bad actors. So there was another... Um, processing, meat processing company uh, in Iowa, for example, that was, you know, really doing terrible things, uh, treating their workers very badly, uh, and, and were indeed manipulating the system. That kind of employer should be gone after. You should not have an employer who is hiring people who are unauthorized because he knows that, you know, he can treat them, you know, like, like uh, non-entities, not pay them, you know, right. bad working conditions. You don't want that. So those kinds of employers should be gone after. But the idea of, you know, picking up the landscaper and treating right. the landscaper the same as you would, you know, somebody was a member of MS-13, that's crazy. And yet but I suppose, yeah. yeah. But I suppose the Biden administration, if they're not doing that, and, you know, which is good in my opinion and yours, um, Maybe that takes a little of the pressure off, and they can say, "Okay, look, things are better. We're not. We're not going to have the nightmare." You know. The, yeah, but but yeah, they're, they're, but there's they're, still uncertainty over yeah, these people yeah, and their the kids. Sort of family, you know, that hangs over these people's heads and their kids' heads. I mean, again, there are you know there are kids you know even beyond the DACA recipients now there are kids who were bought five years ago or ten years ago who are not yet uh, eligible to even apply for DACA. And by the way, that judge shut down future applications. There. There is no way to apply for DACA now. Uh, the existing population that's in it may have some reprieve, but there's no there's no new applicants being taken, and you know they don't um, they don't have any hope. They have no. They're going to live in the shadows. They're going to live their entire lives in the shadows, and so are their kids. And just to close, then to come back to a couple of things we discussed a bit, but um, on the Democrats, I guess also how much I guess I come back to the question. This is thinking about the 2019, 2020 presidential debates and the degree to which you had to be almost for open borders to stay on the stage and uh, it seemed like. Um, and I mean, how, how much pressure would there be from the left, both in sort of, um, you know, in, more, more broadly and then I, actually in Congress even, if the Biden administration tried to do some modest things but didn't try to do everything and were willing to do a little more border enforcement as a price to get some Republicans? I mean, does that just become very very, very difficult for the Democrats. They, they can't cut, get to the deal the way they did in 2013, which where they got almost every Democrat in the Senate for a bill that included stuff that was pretty tough on the border, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. And um, and look, the, the problem at the border is not the you know future landscaper or poultry worker. It's that you know some very bad people can come in that way as right. well. And in fact, what we're seeing at the border now, even in terms of the unauthorized population that is showing up there, 
uh, huge numbers of people that are not from Mexico or Central America. You know, Haitians are the, the latest. Venezuelans uh, are coming up, other uh, South Americans, but also people from the Middle East, Afghans, uh, people from Pakistan, people from uh, Africa uh, that are trying to come that way. And most of these people, I'm sure, are good, hardworking people who just want to, you know, have a better life. But, you know, some bad apples can get through, too. So we do have to have border enforcement. We, we have to have a system that works. Um, you know, I don't know what the progressives would do. I mean, maybe the progressives will be somewhat chastened by the election, uh, you know, yesterday. Uh, maybe they will look and say, maybe we've sort of overstepped our, you know, overreached. Um, I, you know remains to be seen with, you know, somebody like Congresswoman Jayapal or, you know, uh, 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 you know, Omar or any of, you know, the squad, uh, uh, whether or not they will, uh, they will come to their senses or not. But, uh, you know, part of it is going to be the advocacy community, the immigrant community itself saying, look, we want something done, even if we can't get everything we want done, we want at least some things done. And, you know, we'll see. Now that seems important because it seems right now that you sort of got the worst, if you're a Democrat or, or pro-immigration advocate, you've got the worst of both worlds. You sort of got all the, uh, you're not making much progress in reality and you're sort of still out there exposed, so to speak, to the anti-immigration forces and demagogues. And the next time there's a problem with the border and there's gonna be one, right? So it's, I, I think they're sort of, they're not, you know, it's, it's not a, they may think this is an acceptable status quo for now, but I'm a little dubious that it's, you know, it's, it's sustainable, I guess, is the way I mean, leaving aside even the, the injustices and the practical problems of not having workers and sort of Damocles over other workers' heads and so forth. I just wonder how sustainable it is, which I guess, you know, you might, it would be my last question. What do you think happens if just analytically leaving aside what we would like in 2022 in, in Congress and in the, do you think the issue comes back up in a bad way or not so much in 2022, 2024? I mean, what's your sort of one, one well, three year I, prognosis? I some of it will depend on what happens to the, you know, legislative, you know, proposals that are out there right now. Some of it will depend on whether or not uh, the pro-immigrant folks are able to get at least a few little tweaks to the system in through the reconciliation bill. Um, you know, 2022 is going to be a tough year. We didn't see normal legislative process this year. There's no way in you know, hell that we're going to see it next year uh, in an election year. Uh, Congress just doesn't work the way it used to. Yeah. And I worked on Capitol Hill. I started off my political career in Washington, working in the Judiciary Committee uh, in the House. Uh, you know, we used to have hearings and we used to consider legislation. It would be amended. It would go to the floor for a vote and there would be further amendments. It would be debated. Uh, and we got big things done back in those days, uh, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, which, you know, when, when you go back and read the, the floor debates on that, it was just remarkable uh, that that passed and it passed in the way in which it did. We don't do those things anymore. I mean, 2013 is not ancient history, though, and that's exactly what happened in the Senate, yeah. really. So Yes, that is, yeah. But, but then, not then now, House, I think. Yeah, but then, you know, um, Rush Limbaugh and company uh, killed it in the House, and that's exactly what happened. And, you know, Tucker Carlson is probably smarter uh, than anyone since uh, Rush Limbaugh, and he's got a huge audience, and he is virulently anti-immigrant. Yeah, I know that makes you, and so if nothing much happens in 22, it's sort of sitting out there as an issue for Republicans to demagogue going into 2024, Trump himself, of course, but also people who want to yeah. succeed Trump if Trump doesn't run, and on the Democratic side, it doesn't feel to me, it still feels to me that the primary dynamic, the dynamics in the primaries let's, I don't know if Biden doesn't run, let's say, would still be very, very hard to make, to sound like you are sounding today and being, you know, willing to not, not to say that there are some bad actors trying to come across the border and some of the enforcement's necessary and we can't just do away with ICE. You could change his name, but you're going to have to have some human beings who work for the federal government who are doing, right. you know, control, immigration control and enforcement, right? I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, we, you know, so it, that's a somewhat we're, we're not process. Europe, we, we don't have the European Union where you can go through borders. And even, you know, even during the pandemic, the, the borders right. in Europe were not open. So yeah, we're, we're not going to ever get to that point. Um, and, you know, hopefully, um, there'll be at least some modest changes. And hopefully, we won't be having this conversation, you know, three years hence, and, 
having it the same exact conversation again. Uh, no, that would be bad. Well, we will have this conversation again. I, maybe I hope we've worked three years and that's why I hope it's a happier one. And I suppose in a way, the upside might be that doing some things, even if they're incremental and modest, or especially if they're incremental and modest on immigration, could become a way of uh, example for other areas as well. We get yeah. out of this kind of all or nothing yeah. politics and, and, and so forth. But, I, but it does require leadership from within both parties. Maybe there'll be a little more openness to some Republicans. Maybe some Democrats will get a little worried after yesterday. Maybe the Biden administration will realize that they can pass. I mean, honestly, they I, I even think just as a practical matter politically, they're crazy to think the infrastructure stuff is all positive and the immigration stuff's all negative. I think, you know, in fact, a lot of swing voters are kind of look at the 3.5 trillion and say, oh my God, that's an awful lot of yeah. money, typical Democrats. And they look at the DACA kids and they say, why are we right. running right. away from getting his medical degree and, you know, working at my local hospital? If they spent one, yeah, I agree totally. If they spent one tenth of the time on DACA that they'd spent on infrastructure, uh, they'd be politically better off, not worse yeah. off. And, you know, and if, and, and they might get some Republicans who would look a little more like the original infrastructure bill, you know, where they would get some Republican support, perhaps if they gave Republicans something on some border enforcement. And 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 look, if some of the left progressives in the House don't want to support it, they probably could get some Republicans. But again, none of it happens if, if you don't have the, if you don't right. try to make it happen, right? You have to have the will. There has to be the political will. Well, that's a good note to end on. I don't know if that's a glass half full or a glass half empty note, but it's a it's a true note. So, um, Linda, thanks thanks an awful lot for joining me today. We will have this conversation again. It, it is an important issue. I just think for the country, both uh, morally and socially and culturally, as it were, in terms of this being a nation of immigrants and all, I've been more struck by that in recent years, really, than I had before. I've got to say, I mean, I've always known it, but uh, just how important it is for the spirit of the country, and then practically, just in terms of economic growth. Uh, uh, and, and, and prosperity, it, it's kind of crazy, our current situation. It's who we are as Americans. Yeah, and we should, we should, yes. And, and this is a happy case where I think being truer to who we are as Americans would actually be just practically good in the short term. Sometimes you do pay, there's a trade-off, right? You, you know, you pay some price for doing the right thing. I kind of think in this case, the, the values and the interests are aligned, but uh, we just need to get some political leadership, as you said. So Linda, thanks a whole lot for joining me today. Uh, we'll do it again. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.